my name is Robbie Coleman. Um, I work, an organi work for an organization based in London. Um, so if the OECD could all have all their events at Nesta, that would be, that would be convenient for me. Um, and, uh, and we're set up to do two things, um, and in particular with two gaps in mind. Um, the EF uh, was set up in 2011, and, and our sort of first gap um, is the attainment gap. So uh, what we want to do is support schools in England, um, but also internationally, um, to raise the attainment of children from low-income backgrounds. Um, but the second gap um, that we're focused on is the evidence gap. Um, and we think, um, historically, um, educators, be they school leaders or be they classroom teachers or, or policymakers working in education, um, haven't had access to the kind of high quality information they need um, to support the, the really difficult decisions that they um, want to make. Um, and, and in here, reflecting on this, this, this question um, related to how to nudge the system towards improvement in the space of creativity and critical thinking, um, I wanted to sort of break that down and ask sort of two sub-questions. Um, so the first question is, how can we set up some systems um, that allow us to consistently generate high quality evidence, but generate high quality evidence that's cumulative, um, so that we learn from what others have done before, we don't start from a blank sheet of paper every time. Um, and then the second um, sort of question I want to talk a little bit about is how can we nudge the system towards improvement when we think we've got some information that we want to share. Um, and I think I'm going to be, be challenging here, and I think the title of this, this, this uh, session as nudging the system towards improvement, well, I'm going to suggest that that word nudging implies um, that it might be quite a lot easier than it actually is. Um, I think once we have a finding we want to talk about, and once we have a finding we want to support people to use, and, and importantly to contextualise, that is almost an entirely different question and an entirely different process than generating that information in the first place. I mean, one of the, the lessons that we have learned over the last um, eight years doing what we've been doing in England is that you can, you can have a really um, simple idea that you just need to um, produce a really nice report or, or design a really nice website and then people will come to it and they will start changing their practice and actually that doesn't happen. You almost need to put as much effort um, into that, that step of mobilization um, and evidence use um, as you do um, the time and the care that goes into generation in the first place. Um, so an example I wanted to talk about um, is one of the projects uh, that the EEF has, has funded. The EEF, as I said, was set up in 2011, um, and in that time we funded 190 projects um, in England. Um, those 190 projects are all set up um, with uh, an independent evaluation built in. So every time we give a grant to an organization to run a project in schools, we give a second grant to an independent evaluator following the principles that Barbara set out um, related to pre-registration, um, uh, related to uh, making sure there's an independence to the design of the measures that are used. Um, and the majority of those studies, the majority of those 190 studies, um, are set up with a, with a randomized control trial component. Um, and the example I wanted to talk about um, is a study that we're actually doing in partnership with another organization about five minutes down the road, um, which is called the Royal Society of the Arts. And we've partnered with them uh, to, to conduct five randomized control trials, um, looking at ways to develop cultural learning and with a real emphasis on, on creativity and critical thinking. And one of the studies that we are doing as part of that project is called the Young Journalist Academy. Um, the project is aimed at students who are in grade five uh, in English primary schools, so they're about nine years old. Um, and what it does is it tries to improve their, their writing um, by using a really broad range of pedagogies. Um, so the project uh, encourages students to use multimedia, to use podcasts, to use video, um, to write their own newspapers, um, and to really think creatively um, about uh, the ways in which they write, the different media um, with which they write, and encourage their teachers to work with them to encourage um, a sense of enthusiasm and a love of writing. And what we are doing with that project is we're, we're trying to say, we think that this builds on really strong theory. Um, so in, in exactly the same way, uh, Stefan, as I think your report um, develops a really strong and promising intervention. We think we've, we've kind of got that stage, and now we want to do uh, what we would call an efficacy trial. Um, so we've recruited 100 primary schools um, across England. We've randomized them into treatment and control group. Um, and as part of that trial, we're going to assess the outcomes of the project in different ways. So we're going to have a really tightly focused academic outcome, um, which is based on students' uh, writing outcomes. 
Um, but we're also going to have outcomes related to students' sense of self-efficacy as writers. And we're also going to have uh, an outcome that's called an ideational outcome related to the degree to which students are creative um, and the number of ideas and the quality of ideas that students create. And our view is that that study, um, we think, respects the idea that creativity and critical thinking skills, we think, have intrinsic merit in their own right. But we also think that teachers um, and school leaders and educators want to know information about how developing these skills relate to some of the outcomes that they're going to be held accountable for um, in high stakes tests um, and want to understand better that relationship. So in a sense, we think we can make a, a nuanced argument that doesn't say the only reason we are doing this is to improve those tests, um, but that respects that we work in a, in a particular context and that certain outcomes um, are, are valued um, and uh, we want to know more about those relationships. So, so that's the sort of frame uh, of the project. Um, so that project is going on. It will, it will report um, next year. Um, and I, I guess for, for me, it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons. Um, one is that point about multiple outcomes. Um, but the other is I think it, it busts some myths um, about the potential and the possibility of doing that kind of randomized uh, control trial in this, in this area. And also the appetite for educators and schools to participate. So that trial, as I mentioned, um, has 100 schools taking part. Um, across England. Um, that school is only one of our projects, and our projects have now hit a sort of important milestone from the EF's perspective, which is that 50% of schools and colleges in England, that's 12,000 institutions, um, have now participated um, in a, a large-scale randomized controlled trial um, funded by the EF. And that scale, um, we think, really demonstrates um, that there's a pretty conclusive answer to a question that we didn't know the answer to 10 years ago, which is that was there an appetite for this type of evaluation and was there a willingness for educators um, to, take, to take part in it? Um, and we have found pretty conclusively, we think, um, that although all of our, our findings haven't been as, as positive as, as Barbara's, um, people want to um, put their ideas to the test and you can uh, conduct that kind of research in English schools. So that's, if you like, the, the generation um, side of the argument. We think you can generate um, evidence. We think it takes time, it takes money. The EF was very lucky to be set up with an endowment of 125 million pounds in the English Department for Education. Um, it takes concerted effort. We think it is possible. The second half um, of the question, um, if we're thinking about nudging the system towards improvement, is how then do you put that evidence to work? How do you mobilize? How do you support school leaders? And how do you support individual classroom teachers um, to, to use that evidence and to contextualize that evidence? And there are two um, sort of strands of this work that, that I wanted to mention. Um, the first is how important we think it is uh, to involve teachers and school leaders um, in both the synthesis um, and the support stages of, of helping people use that evidence. So something that the EEF has increasingly started to do um, is to say that, that synthesis needs not just to be created by researchers, um, remote from practitioners, but we need to follow a model um, where the questions we are answering um, have been put to us directly um, by practicing classroom teachers and senior leaders. So the EF produced now, I thought I would show one, um, guidance reports. This is a guidance report on metacognition and self-regulation, which is really, really um, a popular area um, for teachers in, in English schools. And we've produced this report um, by putting together a panel. So we followed, for example, the model um, used by uh, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in Healthcare in England, um, where researchers and practitioners sit together on the same panel, define quite tightly the scope of the questions that they want uh, answers to, and they produce clear recommendations um, which are produced and have an authority based on the process by which they, were, they are produced. So it's not academics speaking uh, to teachers and saying you should take this up. We think it's a, it's a process of co-construction, which we think is really important if your ideas are going to have legs uh, and they're going to be taken up in the classroom. The second thing that, that we've done, um, and uh, this is a, a really sort of new uh, element of our work, or, or it's definitely new in terms of the amount of emphasis we're putting on it, is trying to work as closely as we can with schools um, to, to support the application in different contexts of evidence. 
So we know that the gap between um, a finding that, that teachers read about in a paper or even a, uh, a recommendation that teachers read about um, in a guidance report such as this one is often really quite far from their practice. There are challenges related to phase, um, so evidence generated in primary schools might be really difficult um, to apply in an early years setting um, or in a secondary school or a further education setting. And there are also many, many, many challenges related to subject. And a big conclusion of our um, metacognition and self-regulation guidance is a good example of this, where in, ef in effect the headline of the metacognition guidance is metacognition is not a generic general skill. Um, supporting students to be metacognitive means supporting them to be metacognitive when they write. Supporting them to be metacognitive uh, when they are planning uh, a gymnastics move in PE. Um, and that, that contextualization is something that we think is really, really hard um, to support from a single report, however detailed, however many annexes there are. So something that the Education Endowment Foundation has been really pleased to support um, is the development of a network of schools um, called the Research Schools Network, um, working across um, England. So we have now got 40 schools um, as part of this network. And what those schools do is they say, in our areas and in our context, so we have uh, early years um, nurseries, uh, all the way through to further education settings, working with students from 16 to 18. Um, and acting as beacon schools to say, we have taken something like the, the guidance report and we're now going to run training, we're going to run courses, we're going to produce exemplification, um, we're going to produce tools of what it means for us um, to put this evidence into practice. And something we found really, really striking is that the appetite for engagement with that work um, has uh, increased every single time we've increased our capacity to engage. So every time we add a new school to a network, we find there's a new pocket um, of practice across England where people are waiting and keen to, to engage with this. We also find that the difference that it makes having teachers, um, having school leaders in particular communities, advocating for and explaining how they have contextualized and how they've used evidence um, in their settings is orders of magnitude more effective um, than having academics from outside coming in and guessing how it might work. It absolutely helps to have academic input. We absolutely have to support these schools to develop their capacity, to develop their knowledge, um, to develop their understandings of some of the evidence bases um, that are being produced. Um, but, but that next step of saying what I did with this metacognition report as a PE teacher or what I did as a geography teacher um, to put it into context, the tools that I developed um, and the tactics and the, the classroom repertoire in a way that I produced um, is what is needed and is, is the, if you like, the bridge across this gap um, between the evidence that we produce, the evidence that we generate and the chance of it actually having an impact on practice. So I guess just to sum up, um, my view is that nudging the system towards improvement underplays it. It's going to be really, really difficult. Um, and almost we need to think that there are these two distinct challenges of, of generating a consistent evidence base, an accumulative evidence base, and then applying that evidence base um, in practice. But the really encouraging thing um, is that we think there is an appetite for this. And we think that when we put in consistent effort and concerted effort, we don't underestimate um, the effort that is going to be needed. Um, then we think there is a tremendous uh, potential for, for improvement in this work. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.